Welcome back to the channel, you curd nerds. Today we've got yet another mock check ride. This one's going to be another private pilot one. A lot of people aren't asking for IFR or commercial or multi-engine check rides. Um, and if they are, they're not really okay with us recording it. So if you are interested in getting a mock check ride, whether it be private pilot, commercial instrument, sport pilot, any of those check rides other than type ratings or airline interview prep, go use the links below. The website is trainingwithcheese.com. Get your mock check ride scheduled. But let's get into what this mock check ride is going to be all about. So this one's going to be up in the, the Northeast. So we're worried about things like icing. Uh, it's a carbureted Cessna 172 November model. So it's got the 40 degrees of flaps. So we talk about that. There's also some unique situations to uh, his airspace that me not flying in this person's airspace, me not operating around that area, I don't know about these things. So when I was looking through his nav log, there were some things that concerned me that I was like, hey, this looks a little weird. But let's hear a message from our sponsors real quick, and then we'll get right into the check ride. Are you tired of using things like this for Microsoft Flight Sim or whatever sim you happen to use for practicing, whether it be for fun or actually practicing for training? Well, if that's the case, might I recommend Desktop Pilot? Desktop Pilot is one of the few manufacturers that actually produce equipment for your personal desktop sim that represents the aircraft appropriately. So they have flap handles that look exactly like a Cessna flap handle, and they even have entire panels of all the switches you'd ever need. They even make fun little like spring back ones, and the key even comes out in the event that you don't want somebody starting your sim. And I don't know if you noticed there, they're all held in with simple screws, meaning that you can buy individual components one at a time and then eventually build up your whole sim as opposed to some of these other manufacturers where if you want a whole big fancy sim, you're dropping 10, 15, $20,000. These you can buy all the components individually and put it together as you go. So go to desktoppilot.com and use promo code cheesepilot10 for 10% off. Let's get into the mock check ride. All right, so I'll just ask one more time since we hit the record button. I like to get it, you know, recorded so there's no like mm -hmm. questions, right? Uh, are sure. you okay with this uh, being recorded and being used for content, not just on TikTok, but also Instagram, YouTube, and whatever right. other weird platforms come out in the future? <laughs> uh, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Awesome, and you are, Phil, Phil Brown. There you are. Yes. You have an entire folder, like full of plans of action specifically for these things. Oh, um, sure. So I like to get straight into, you know, what a DPE is going to do. As soon as you go in for a check ride, DPE is going to ask for all your documents, your logbook, um, and make sure that, well, you showed up with the appropriate stuff, right? You know, you're, you need yeah. your pilot certificate, photo government issued photo ID, right? So social security card is technically a government issued ID, but it's not a photo ID, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> any, anything that you need for your medical certificate, even if the flight's not technically planned for that day, if your medical certificate says you need glasses, then bring your glasses with you. Right. Okay. Yeah. L logbook. Um, I know it's technically not your responsibility to verify that all your endorsements are correct. Cause like you haven't been trained to verify that your endorsements are correct. Yeah. Um, but if you do want to look, the advisory circular is 6165 H and that's going to be all the, uh, endorsements necessary for, um, check rides. It's going to be in the yeah. appendix way in the back. Um, if you want to look through that. All right. I, uh, read through that the other day, actually. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So we'll get right into, uh, what are the three outcomes of any check ride, right? You've got, um, Satisfactory. That's what everyone wants to hear. It means you're consistently within the standards. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't fall outside of the standards momentarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that you um, don't need to look something up. It just means that you are consistently with inside the standards. Right. Then there's unsatisfactory consistently outside of the standards. Things that would immediately cause an unsatisfactory event um, <clears throat> would be like an instructor having to take over or the DPE having to take over. Uh, to prevent, you know, life, limb, eyesight, damage to property, damage to the aircraft, violation of any uh, federal aviation regulations. Pretty, pretty straightforward. All right. Um, now, even in the oral portion, there's not the expectation that you're going to 
know everything that you're going to have a perfect response to every question that's being asked. A lot of DPEs, what they'll do is they'll ask questions and then they'll dig farther down that subject to see where the knowledge ends. Not necessarily to try to fail you or get you flustered or anything like that. They're just continuing down this line of questioning to see, okay, well, they understood that. How far does this go? <clears throat> or is do they just have kind of like a rote memorization of this subject, right? Um, so don't get flustered. I know a lot of check rides I've been on the, you answer confidently and the DPE responds with, are you sure? And you're like, well, I was until you fucking asked that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you know, it was right. But like, I just wanted to see how sure you felt. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> it's kind of a dick thing to do, but it happens. Right. And then right. we have, uh, incomplete, right? Incomplete. Um, <clears throat> that just means that like we ran out of time, weather, aircraft, airworthiness, uh, don't let a DPE kind of bully you into exceeding your personal minimums, right? Okay. Um, I keep hearing horror stories of people like failing check rides because they uh, they were like, hey, I'm not comfortable in 15 knot direct crosswinds. And the DPE is like, well, is that a limitation of the aircraft? And they're like, well, no, but like, I'm no, not comfortable. I'm yeah. So don't done. let the don't let the DPE bully you past a uh, an incomplete, right? If you aren't comfortable yeah. with the weather conditions, obviously if the ASOS is like winds calm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm not comfortable with that. What? what, what? <laughs> um, it's like, it's like, would like 10 crosswind be a reasonable like expectation? I or, mean, what's, uh, or... it really is like, what have you flown in? Right. Okay. okay. So up in, you know, Grand Forks, North Dakota, 10 knot crosswind is nothing. Sure. Right. Sure. But if okay. you're in the, you know, in the calmest belt of wind ever. And you know, wind yeah. barely picks up ever th over three. Like you're not even sure where the wind sock is. Cause you never have to look at it. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but you know, incomplete exceedance of uh, personal minimums, exceedance of, uh, aircraft's limitations, uh, air airworthiness, illness, right? If you're not feeling good, just yeah. let them know. Right. There's no need for you to do a check ride and fail it because you got, because you ate Thai food last night. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, next one is just me. Have you read through the airman certification standards? Have you read through the ACS and you understand the, the rule, the standards that you're being held to right here. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Ready to go. All right. So I start out with systems and limitations. Cause if you don't understand your aircraft, um, it's probably not going to go very well for the rest of it. Makes right. sense. Right. Makes sense. Um, so if I remember correctly, you've got the, uh, you've got a couple glass items in your flight deck. Yep. Uh, uh, we got a 430 and, um, two G5 stack. Those G5s are nice. I keep wanting to put one in my seaplane, but I'm afraid they're not waterproof. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's just get into the engine. What kind of engines in this thing? Uh, it's a Lycoming engine, uh, horizontally opposed four cylinders. Naturally aspirated, um, carbureted, 160 horsepower. Yeah, 160 horsepower. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you know the, Do you know the cubic inches of it? It's uh, uh they're three twenty, uh, three forties, um, three twenties. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's either three twenty. Uh, I, mean, I can pull my POH and look exactly, but it's nah, that's fine. It's a three twenty, right? Three twenty. Um, yeah. Yep. Now, what kind of gas can you put in this thing? Uh, a hundred low lead, and there was one more in the POH that we can't get at our field. I don't remember what it is. Um, but I don't think they. Sell, I don't think they sell it anymore, anyways. So, um, like yeah. eighty low lead or something like that. Uh, it's 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 just a hundred no lead. There's just no lead. lead at all, right? Um, yeah. So the lead isn't necessary for this aircraft, right? It's the right. low enough compression doesn't ha doesn't need yeah. that anti knock agent. Right. right. Awesome. Now, if you were to take this aircraft to um, Alaska, right, it's pretty cold up in Alaska. Do you know where you could find um, what kind of oil you'd want to put in it? Like what weight oil? Um, let me look in the POH because there's three different ranges that it wants. It is if it's real cold out below a 10W30 or SA20. All right. If it's below 10 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 12 Celsius. Awesome. Awesome. So I, you know where to look it up. You know where to find it. 
Um, yeah, it's, <clears throat> yeah. Let's it go also this. says on our oil, on, on our flap, the, yep. the calendar flap, it says it right there. Awesome, awesome. Let's go through some... Uh, um, can you describe this thing's electrical system? Just give me like a brief overview, right? Yeah, so it's uh, an alternator-driven system that's 14 volts, a uh, 60-amp alternator on a uh, 24-volt 20, battery. Um, uh, anything else part of that? Right yeah, now? I mean, so let's... Two, two bus batteries. No, I mean, let's think about that uh, that alternator, right? If the alternator is 12 volts, can we power a 24-volt battery with a 12-volt alternator? I say 12-volt. I, 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 um, it's I a 60 you... Go ahead. Oh, I think you might be breaking it's up a little bit. 14 volts, right? Because it charges... Oh. Those two volts. Are you there? Let me move inside real quick. All right. Hang on. Is that better? Uh yeah yeah that is definitely volt battery. Yeah. Oh. yeah that was just the yeah that's better that was just the one like part that was got a little like you said twelve volt fourteen volt alternator sure. twenty four volt battery um they're generally going to be yeah. right around the same right um yeah yeah I love that you brought up the fact Sorry. that it's sixty amps um it really shows you the limitation Ooh. of what avionics can be put in it right um yeah. <clears throat> So let's get into some limitations, right? Let's go through your V yep. speeds, right? What is VNE and what does it mean? VNE is the never exceed number, uh, which is we don't want to exceed that. <laughs> All right. Wow. What number is it? Uh, it is. Shoot, I just flew a. I've been flying, I've been switching between miles per hour and knots planes. Um, <laughs> so it is. Uh, Top of the yellow arc, which is 160? That's it. Something. It's 160. It's yeah. 160. 170, <laughs> that's when the uh, that's when the wing separation light illuminates. Um, <laughs> um now it's funny because in the in the Airbus there's a switch that actually says wing off. Um, but it's really just it's the wing lights that are off. Oh, okay. or the illumination oh. of the wing. So it's like this is the wing off switch, like it disconnects oh, the that's wings. Funny. <laughs> um, that's funny. You know, you, I make the jokes every once in a while. But uh, so VNO, yeah. what's VNO? VNO is the um, the structural, uh, the maximum structural cruising speed. So oh. like, uh, yeah. All so right. One one twenty ish, somewhere in there, right above one twenty. Yeah, one 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 twenty eight. Yeah. And what does that allow you? Like, when would I want? When would I be allowed to exceed that? Uh, so that's your uh, in stable air with no flaps and clean, you know, smooth flight. Awesome. It's kind of it's your yellow arc kind of in there. All right. Now, <clears throat> VA. What's VA? Uh, VA is your maneuvering speed, which okay. is uh, it's like uh, in knots. It's this is I need to just start using the plane that I'm doing my check ride in. Um, <laughs> uh, which we are. It's in its hundred hour right now. So the last few days we've been All right. flying different planes, but it is a, a ten to fifteen above the green arc. It's ninety ninety something knots, ninety six knots. I mean, it falls within yeah. that, so it changes, right? Yeah. All right. Can you tell tell me why it changes, or like yeah, what would cause it to change? Uh, it depends on your setup. Flaps would change it, or no, you don't want flaps above there. Um, Bank angle would change. Weight of the plane would change it. Uh, so if you're in the if you're in the utility category, right? Um, it's or, really just going to be weight. It just changes just with weight. weight. Yeah, it's okay. the, the only thing that changes VA is weight. And um, the reason it changes, excuse me, the reason it changes with weight, it's, it's about it, it's about available lift, right? Okay. That's 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 what it is. Oh, okay. uh, how much more lift can that wing generate 
comparative to what it's already generating. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if yeah. the airplane breaks at three units of lift, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm already right. carrying, you know, two units of lift. If I am below my maneuvering speed, I can't exceed that three units of lift. There's not enough available lift left, right? Right. So that's why we, uh, that's why it changes with weight, okay. right? Uh, knowing right. exactly what it is compared to your weight is kind of important because what does VA allow you to do? Uh, turns <laughs> like uh, maneuver. It's yeah. not just it's not just turns because I mean, you know, I carry a, I I'll put my airplane up at max gross weight and I can still turn right. It'd be kind of awkward to put an airplane at max gross weight and be unable to sure. fly it other than straight and level, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, it allows you to um, do your maneuvers like steep turns and so it allows one full deflection of one control surface. Okay. Right. right. And the aircraft will either stall or it won't be able to generate enough force to damage the aircraft. Okay. Okay. So if you are below maneuvering speed and you just reef back on the yoke all the way to your chest, the airplane's going to stall before it breaks. But same thing. If you push all the way forward, it's not necessarily going to stall before it breaks, but you're not going to be able to apply enough force to it to break it. As long as you okay. obviously maintain below, you know, an appropriate airspeed. Obviously, if you push yeah. forward, the airplane's going to start to accelerate. But right. the same thing with the rudder, right? This doesn't right. mean I can slip. This just means I can kick a rudder pedal all the way and not risk damaging the aircraft. Okay. okay. Um, okay. It's one swift control or it's one, you know, full deflection of a single control surface once. So it's not oscillations or anything like that. All right. Okay. That's what maneuvering speed allows me to do. So you've brought up flaps a couple different times. What's the max speed at which you could have full flaps? It's uh, 90 knots, top of the green arc, or top of the wide arc. Uh, it might like, be 90 miles an hour. I know in your POH that I pulled this from, it's 85, and that's what it is in most Cessnas. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. That, that Miles per hour, it might yeah. be 90, um, but in yeah. most... I think yeah. other than like some older straight tail Cessnas, it's 90. Okay. 85. Uh, yep. 85. And we've talked about a couple different markings on the, the airspeed indicator. Let's go through them, right? So what's the bottom of the white arc? What does that indicate? Uh, the bottom of the white arc is your uh, slowest speed with uh, everything out. Uh, VFE. Right. No, VS. VSO. Yeah. VSO, right? The way yeah. I remember it is stuff out. Right. Oh yeah. VSO. We call, we call it shit out here. <laughs> shit out stuff out. You know, potato potato. Uh, right, right. <laughs> now, what's the top of the white arc? We already talked about it. What is it? Oh, that's your flaps where you can put your flaps in. So it'd be VFE. VFE. And, <clears throat> all right. Now you've got uh your plane's carbureted, right? So you've got some sure. concerns with it being carbureted. I'm, I forget exactly mm-hmm. where you're operating. I think you're operating somewhere up in the the, the we're, northeast. We're Bend Oregon. Okay. So it can get a little foggy. It can get, you know, cold and moisture up yeah. there. Right. So yeah. what do I need to be concerned about? If my, uh, if I'm looking at, do you have a carb temperature indicator? I know some of we them don't. don't. We no, don't. You don't. All right. Well, if it's, if it's, you know, below 40 degrees outside, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, what would I be concerned about with my carburetor? Yeah. We got carb ice issues. Okay. Um, so. How would you, how would you recognize carburetor icing? Yeah, car rice is usually a slow diminish of RPMs over time. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, all right. That's awesome. How would you deal with it? Uh, we'd put the car ice on, car heat on. <laughs> Duh. Now, um, what would you expect? No, no, it, huh? What would you expect? You put the car heat on, now what are you expecting? Yeah, so it's going to start melting all that ice that's in the carburetor. And so the engine's going to run rough until the moisture gets out of that. Um, mixture. And so um, it's going to be rough for a little bit and then the RPM should start c- climbing back. Yeah, that's awesome. But, yeah. Now, you talked about uh, utility category. What's the max weight in which you could still be in the ki- utility category? Um, I don't know. Let me look into my POH. Awesome. I don't know what that number is exactly off the top of my head. Five. Where is it? Five. <laughs> Chapter five. 
is all the way down stuff. It's early in it. So it might be in the weight and balance, and it might also be in the limitations section. Oh, okay. Um, Are you hinting? <laughs> I mean, I'm just like... <clears throat> there we go. Um, 2000. It's 2000. So why would you want to keep the aircraft in the utility category? Um, if you're doing uh, heavy maneuvers that have lots of Gs in it, um, yeah. Spins, right? spins, yeah. So, um, this one, since your aircraft, it's got some fun little limitations, right? That are that are kind of hard to track down. So, I just want to see if you've uh, seen these. I know there's a placard for it specifically, but you're planning a camping trip, right? And you got to bring a cooler and a tent and a bunch of other camping supplies, right? You've already filled yep. the cabin and the seats with either people or gear. Um, yep. And in the back, all you've got to do is fit a cooler that weighs, a uh, cooler and food that weighs eighty pounds, right? and a tent that weighs 46 pounds. Can you put these both in the rear cargo and still be within nope. the limitations? Nope. No? Why you not? Have a, you have a, I'm trying to find it exactly. You have a a limit for the max of what's in the back seat and the cargo together, and they can't exceed the total weight. And then there's a limit for what's in that cargo, the back cargo area. I have it underlined and circled in here. And it is right there. Uh, yeah, so the baggage one and two can't exceed 120 pounds. All right. So, yeah, and this collection of cargo yep. weighs about 126, right? Yep. Yep. So, you know, we got to leave a case of beer behind. Shucks. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to leave a human behind. They don't get that <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> now, this thing has 40 degrees of flaps, correct? Uh, Yes. All right. Is there anything that you want to avoid um, with all those flaps down? Yeah, slips. All right. Do you know why? Uh, yeah, there's just not enough lift to keep you going with that much. Right? It'll, you, you want too much. It'll stall. It'll stall the tail. Yeah. It oh, shrouds okay. the tail and stalls the tail. I did that once, and then I read the POH. <laughs> oh, uh, there's a big old placards on ours that say... Avoid slips. They don't say don't do them, but it says avoid slips with flaps. Yep. Yep. You could shroud the tail, and if you shroud the tail, it won't have any smooth airflow over it, so it won't function, right? Yep. So don't do that, because the nose drops rapidly, and you go, what the fuck? <laughs> You're like, I didn't stall. I didn't hear the stall horn. Um, okay. <clears throat> all right. So let's run through some emergencies real quick. Um, sure. Talk me through an engine fire on start. So you... You're go, you go to start this thing, and whoosh, mm -hmm. big old fire comes out of the cowling. What are you going to do, other than scream? <laughs> <laughs> no, you remain calm. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to uh, keep cranking, but uh, starve it of fuel. So throttle, idle, and mixture, mixture uh, pull, pull it all back, and keep it cranking. And, and if, it, um, if it goes, great. If not... Um, then we're, we're going to do it for, like, I think the POH says two to three minutes to crank it, uh, to clear all that out and hopefully get all of it off. So, so I think you're mixing up two different, cause this, this checklist has a, it has two kind of if statements, all right? So okay. if engine starts, that's where you're seeing those two to three minutes. Cause it says yeah. if engine starts power 1700 RPM for a few minutes, yeah. okay. all right? Um, if it doesn't start, then that's the throttle full mixture cutoff, continue cranking. I think it, I think it was about a minute for the continue yeah. cranking portion. Um, okay. and then you're, you're shutting it down and getting out and right? so yeah. just make sure we recognize the, 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 if statements on that, cause if it catches fire yeah. and starts, right, it's going to be kind of, yeah. right. So <clears throat> let's yeah. talk about an electrical fire. How would you tell the difference between like an electrical fire and a fuel fire, you know, just cruising along, like we're in cruise. Yeah. Smell is a big de uh, detection of electrical fires. It smells like rubber, plasticky kind of smell. All right. So if we had an electrical fire, what are you going to do? We're out cruising along 9,000 feet, electrical fire. Your toes starting to get warm because the wires down there are getting toasty. Sure. Uh, we'll turn off the bus bar and uh, and uh, see what happens there. If it, um, if it goes out, then um, maybe... Turn on some essentials one at a time, but yeah, we're gonna have power to it and uh, get the fire extinguisher out if we need to. 
All right. So <clears throat> one thing I just want to bring up, close your cabin heat and air. Because um, okay. if you had the heat on, that heat, there could be a, a, a rupture in, in one of those hoses that brings your heat into the cabin, okay. and it's pointing straight at your wires, and that's why they're on fire. But also, if you have the cabin heat open or cabin air open, that's just feeding oxygen to the fire. So just make sure okay. that's part of the checklist, right? Master off, avionics off, all switches other than ignition off. You said bus bar. That includes all of it, right? Vents uh, closed, fire extinguisher used, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> all right. Now let's get into spin recovery. How do you recover from a spin in this aircraft? Uh, power idle, ailerons neutral, elevator down, and... Yeah, that's it, right? Well, no, don't right forget your feet. Rudder right opposite, right opposite, yeah. yeah. Don't forget your feet, right? Yeah, um, right do you understand like the reasoning behind all those uh, those statements, all those re all, all those steps, right? So power idle. Why are we bringing the power to idle? Well, we don't want to add more energy to the system at all this right. point um, yet. Um, the aileron down is to break the stall to give it to get good airflow over the wings and neutral. Same with neutral. Because as the wings are stalled, you want to keep that. You want to get it stabled off so you have clean air coming over the wings as you come down. All right. So do you know what would happen? Like, so we said power idle, right? We don't want to add any more energy into this messed up situation, right? Um, aileron's neutral. <clears throat> so if I'm spinning and I just try to bank out of it, do you know what's yeah. going to happen? It's going to. It's going to spin faster. It's going to spin faster, yeah. It's going to spin faster because all that's going to do is continue to stall the inside wing even worse, right? Do you know how to tell which rudder to press? I know it says opposite direction, right? But right. I don't know about you. If you, when you go on like roller coasters and they start spinning you around, you really know which direction you're spinning. Um, no, no, not, not really. Um, right. So, fight, the, hit the rudder that fights you. Right. Okay. Hit the rudder that fights. Right. Um, okay. Elevator briskly forward. Right. We talked about that. Break the stall. So. Yep. <clears throat> you're going out on a, a VFR cross country, right? You don't have an instrument rating. You're not taking an instrument rating check ride or anything like that. Um, just private pilot. You're on a VFR cross country. What are you going to do if that visibility starts to go down? And, you know, cause again, you're way up there, fog and visibility dropping isn't really that, uh, that unheard of. So sure. what's your steps uh, that you're going to do if you get into what looks like IFR conditions? Uh, yeah. So we're going to bug our heading immediately and but our altitude to make sure that we don't start dropping or we're going to trust our instruments to make sure that we're staying level um and then i'm going to start a 180 degree turn standard rate turn at three degrees and i'm going to use the turn coordinator which is that little the, the second one down and we're going to start a timer and uh, or hopefully our timer is already going but we're going to note our timer and Turn 180 degrees, and um, it should take about a minute, and we'll be um, hopefully fly the opposite direction back where it was clear, and then reevaluate what we All need right. to do. Well, let's say we did that, and it's been about five minutes, and we're not we're not clear. You still can't see anything. What are you going to do yeah. now? Um, call an ATC and okay. say, "Hey, I'm stuck." Um, and Mike, um, what's the call sign, or what's the what, what's the radio call going to sound like? Yeah, probably will be, I'll uh, say, Seattle Center, Center between my guff. I am at such and such altitude. I am via VFR, but I'm stuck in an IFR situation. I need vectors out and, and help. Yeah, so. that, that's perfect. Make sure you include that, that I'm VFR only portion that yeah. you did include. Because if you just say, hey, I'm in IFR, I need help, they're just going to go, yeah. all right, advise when ready to copy clearance. Right. I'm not going <laughs> to. And you're going to go, what? Um, but I'm also going to make sure that I'm staying straight and level. Yep. Yep. Right. Um, perfect. Perfect yep. way to handle that. Uh, you've got G5s. Uh, shouldn't mm -hmm. be too hard to stay level with the G5. Uh, yeah. Some days it's easier than others, it seems like. I wish I could get some G5s. My attitude indicator falls over and, uh, periodically, and I have to look around and be oh, like, no. is it right? Is no, it it's not. The gyro in it that winds yeah. down. Yeah, it's failing. Um, it's just old. Okay. It's the same attitude indicator that's been in it since 1984. Okay. Um, so the fact that it's 
the fact that it even like even you know gets up at all. Um, <clears throat> so if you do you have an over voltage light? I know a lot of old Cessnas they disable that damn thing. No, we have one. Okay, so what does that mean to you? Um, that means that the oh, I just read it yesterday. Um. Uh, we've, it means the alternator is not working. Is what it means. Okay, so um, awesome. It means that the alternator at some point went to an overvoltage state. Yeah. All right. Um, a lot of people think seeing that overvoltage light means that it is currently overvoltaged and it is going uh, to start frying things. No, we okay. the, your your aircraft actually has an overvoltage relay that causes that light to kick on. If that relay senses an overvoltage state, it kills your alternator. And then shows okay. you that light saying, hey, I killed it because I was over voltage. What are you okay. going to do next? And I know this isn't necessarily an immediate, isn't necessarily a memory item. Okay. Um, but do you have kind of a rough idea on what your plan would be? Uh, let's see if the alternator is not working. We're flying, right? Yeah, we're flying. Uh, um, I would probably flip the left side off of the, of the master let the bat and then battery and get back run off battery to get back to the airport and land. Okay. Well, your aircraft does provide the opportunity for you to, uh, try to reset it. Right. Oh, so you can turn okay. the alternator, you can turn your avionics, your master, um, you can pretty much kill the electronics in the aircraft and start it and flip it back on. And if the light comes back on, then kill it permanently. Can kill it. Okay. Good. Right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, if the light comes back on, your aircraft specifically states uh, land as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. What would be the difference between as soon as possible or as soon as practical? And this um, is just checking some aeronautical decision making on what you're seeing the difference sure. between possible and practical. Yeah, as soon as possible is um, get down. <laughs> like, like, depending on the situation, maybe a field, maybe a private airport maybe you know if there's something like that around um uh, as soon as practical means get done in a safe kind of way you're not you don't need to emergency descent into a field so it's just going to depend on time and distance and mm -hmm. so a great a great way to separate the two is as soon as possible means that there's imminent danger that i need to okay. allevi alleviate right an over voltage right. situation i could cause an electrical fire there's imminent danger Right. But if we right. just went the other direction and it was just discharged, like our alternator just stopped charging, uh -huh. right? It just failed and we aren't getting any power out of it anymore. Is the right. aircraft going to fall out of the sky because our alternator's dead? No. Look at every J3 cub that cuts you off in the pattern. That thing doesn't have an alternator. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. And your PLH specifically says like over voltage soon as possible, under yep. voltage as soon as practical. Right. Okay. So, Soon as possible, imminent danger. Soon as practical, get somewhere that you can possibly get to the ground safely that, that's practical, right? The, what yeah. I've written down that I tell a lot of students, as soon as practical means that the margin of safety has dropped, but there is not a risk of immediate or imminent life or uh, aircraft. And the flight okay. can continue to a practical point of landing as in an airport that might have maintenance to resolve your concern. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, there was somebody that they didn't get a job as an instructor because they were in an aircraft and they, they asked them that exact question. What are you going to do if your alternator uh, fails and you aren't getting any power out of it anymore? He's like, well, I'm going to declare an emergency and land at the airport right beneath me. And he's like, dude, you were 20 minutes away from home. Like, why didn't right. you just fly home? Like, how long is your battery good for? Right. Right. Um, and <clears throat> a flight school is definitely going to get frustrated if you put their airplane somewhere where they can't fix it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay. But uh, pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Uh, let's get into some airworthiness. Right. So what documents would be required for you to have on just a normal VFR day? Sure. You need a airworthiness certificate, which is, um, do you want me to go through the timing limitations on the, on these or just well, is there I? a time, is there a time limit on the airworthiness? There's not. In fact, okay. as, long as, as long as it's kept up with maintenance oh. standards. All right. According to the 80s um, or okay. Yeah, I mean, we'll uh, get into we'll get into like what keeps an aircraft airworthy. We're just looking at documents right okay. now. Okay, so you need then you need your registration. Um, you need a 
uh, operating an official operating handbook with or, or limitations oper, operational limitations uh, POH an official PA, POH is what we use usually in our planes and then um, you need the official weight and balance from uh, oh. yeah oh okay so I forget what year your aircraft is uh it's the ends okay um, so it's like the 90s 80s yeah no, 70s 70s okay so 80s. in 19 in 1970 when this aircraft came out do you think it had gps and, and g5s nope no so is there anything else you need yeah we need all the um all the manuals for any of the upgrades that awesome so the supplements associated the supplement, with any equipment yeah. that wasn't installed originally correct yeah all right um our maintenance um, binders have all of those going um, with them. So, well, and that's why I, I, I want to make sure you bring up the like every okay. specific document because remember, your private pilot certificate doesn't mean you can go fly your school's airplane. Okay. Your private pilot certificate technically means you can go pick up a Cirrus SR twenty two. Okay. Well, okay, maybe not a twenty two because that's high performance, but you get what I'm saying. You can go pick up yeah, yeah. random old airplane, um, yeah. <clears throat> and be fine to fly it. And make sure, okay, just make and sure. And make sure that it's legal, right? Okay. Um, but, so, let's get into um, the logbooks, right? So we know that aircraft, they need maintenance uh, done on a regular uh, interval. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your school's airplane specifically. What does okay. your school's airplane need in its maintenance log? If I was to give you that book and say, hey, tell me if this airplane's airworthy, what would you look for? Yeah, so it needs its annual, um, every annual every year um, uh, and then it needs uh the ours will need a 100 hour tack time 100 hour uh, all right need our vors need to be if we're gonna fly the ifr it'll need to be tested um and then in our um our uh, our static system our pedo static system needs to be Tested every two years, and our um... no, no, you're fine. If you need to write down the acronym, and I mean that's the that's kind of the point of these is you know give you the opportunity yeah. to to work through it. Um, yeah. um, our altimeter needs to be tested every two years, and our transponder needs to be tested every two years, and our ELT is every year. Uh, let's see, every twelve months. Uh, one hour of continuous service or half the usable battery life of it. All right. So if you walk out to the airplane and the ELT is on, can you just okay. turn it off and go? go? No. No. I don't, right. know. I don't know how long it's been. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So this your aircraft, you know, the one you're needing for work or not work, the one you're using uh, at your flight school needs a hundred hour inspection. Um, yep. <clears throat> but let's say you uh, walk out to the airplane, right? And the attitude indicator, sorry, your G5 broke. It's still giving you heading somehow, but the attitude indicator won't, it won't turn on. Is the airplane airworthy? Um, well, I try to think if we have an extra attitude indicator. <laughs> um, Is an attitude but, indicator required for VFR flight? Attitude, attitude indicator. Yeah, yeah. I'm going through eight tomato plants real quick. Um, <laughs> you know, attitude is not needed for a VFR. Yeah. No, no, it's not. No, it's because you. It's because you got a you got a big one outside. Okay. Yeah. The the horizon. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, students want to okay. stare at the attitude indicator inside. It's like, look, you got a bigger one out there. Go go look at that one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, don't need it. I gave you that hint earlier. I told you my attitude indicator is messed up and I still go fly around. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, so let's say, you know, a different piece of equipment is broken, right? It's not in a tomato flames. Okay. Um, where else would you check just to verify? Yeah. So I'm going to go double check in 91, 213. All right. That's usually, that's almost all a tomato flames, but there might be something in there just to double check to be sure. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, there's a, some airplanes have a minimum equipment list. That's an official minimum equipment list. We can go there, but I can also look in the equipment list 
in my POH, and all the R's in my equipment list are going to be required. Um, and um, I'm going to double check any a ADs that might need to be followed through with on that. So Okay. So it's great that you knew to reference 91.213. 91.213? Oh, that's the end. 91.2, well, right? Well, 91.213 is the one that tells you to go check all of these things. Okay. 91.213 says check your kinds of equipment operation list, check your okay. MEL, check your ADs. There's two other things it tells you to check, or three other things it tells you to check. It tells you to check 91.205, which is where you get the A tomato flames and flaps. Yep. Right? That's what I meant, 213, yeah. Um, right. But there's two other things that you you're you need to check in the event that uh you know you're not sure. So there's the type certificate data sheet, right? Is there any oh. equipment required by the type certificate data sheet? And then STCs. Okay. Okay. Um, STCs, for example, there's an STC on the Cirrus, uh, the SR20, right? Um, that changes it from a single prop le- or single thrust lever to a dual throttle and prop control because it has a constant speed prop. I know that's a little bit farther beyond, but either way, yeah. it changes the control setup of the aircraft, okay. right? If that little blue knob or if the lever straight up lever was missing or non-functioning, right? If I just look through the POH, 80s, 91, uh, a tomato flames, that lever missing still means the aircraft's unairworthy. But if I don't check the type certificate data sheets and the STCs, okay, right? Sure. Okay. Um, so do you need a landing light? Like legally? Like I know realistically we should probably have a damn landing light. <laughs> but <laughs> legally, do you need a landing light? Not unless you're a commercial. Yep. So um now does this plane you're using for school, does it need a landing light? Um well, that's a great question. Um is the aircraft being used for commercial use? I mean, I guess yes, because it's being rented for commercial. Yeah. So yes, yeah. it does. Yes, you do. But um, I couldn't you... remember if it's because I'm not flying under commercial certificate. Is it the flyer or the plane? It's the aircraft. It's the aircraft. Okay. The aircraft needs to be operated uh, okay. for commercial use. Okay. Okay. So if you own your own airplane and you start renting it out to people, it needs an operable landing light. Okay. Okay. Um, my landing light in my aircraft keep bur- keeps burning out. I have to replace it like every year and it's annoying. Um, so I don't because <laughs> I don't fly at night. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, <clears throat> just know the extent of the regulation so you're not spending extra money on landing lights because like an LED landing light for my aircraft is like $400. But I know the point, the moment I put that thing in the water, that LED is going to burn out. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to be pissed. Sure. Um, so what changes, let's get into some regs, right? So you understand airworthiness pretty well. You understand, you know, your emergency is pretty good, decent aeronautical decision-making so far, right? Um, maybe just, I know you said you read through the POH, just brush up on it a little more, right? Put it on your nightstand. Um, let's get into the regs. Okay. So what changes for you once you pass your private pilot certificate? Yeah, I'll have, uh, privileges and limitations. Um, uh, privileges I can fly by myself. I can get, um, I can take somebody with, take some passengers with me. All right. Uh, I can, yeah. Uh, they can't pay for anything. That's some of my, my limitations. Uh, we can split it or rata, and, but we have to make sure we have a common purpose as well, that we are all, I can't be air taxi for my friends. And they okay. Have to money. Um, <laughs> uh, so. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that, that's pretty much it. Is there anything you can do to, to, to be compensated? Um, there, I can fly for some nonprofit situations. Um, I, there's some pretty specific rules about what they can and can't be, but I'd go look those up if somebody asked me if I wanted to. Um, no. All right. So, um, now let's say Cessna called you and they're like, yo, we love you. Can you come like demonstrate aircraft for us? And we'll, we'll pay yeah, like yeah, we grand can, a year. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. And we can do it for, if we're selling airplanes, we can take people up for test flights, um, in the, in an air, in, if we're selling, if we're, selling the airplane. Yep. Um, yeah. Now, um, 
Is there any airspace that you're not allowed in as a student pilot that you will be allowed in as a private pilot? Uh, so you're as a student pilot, the Bravos are you're only allowed in with an endorsement. But yeah, I can go into a Bravo. Probably won't, but I can. <laughs> I mean, it's it's intimidating the first time you do it, but like they're they're, they're you just remember they're landing at the Bravo Airport. They're going to be a dick, uh, but just transitioning it. <laughs> okay, they're right. they're they're. It's not going to be that bad. Uh, just remember, don't be nervous with ATC. They're human beings, and it's literally their entire job to make sure you don't crash. Right. 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 Um. <clears throat> let's get into some airspace. I know you were talking about you know you've there's some priv- there there's some limitations right. Mm-hmm. Once you pass your private pilot certificate, can you go to, let's say again, you buy a Cirrus SR-22, it's pressurized oxygen system, the whole nine, you you, you hit the lottery, right? Yeah, um, yeah. The thing's got a service ceiling of like 22,000 feet. Can you take it up there? As a private As a, pilot? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can. All right. So what airspace is up there? Oh, I need to be IFR. Sorry. I awesome. need to be IFR. And above awesome. 18, I need to be IFR. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, what kind of equipment do you need in your aircraft for uh, Bravo airspace? Uh, I need a mode C ADS-B um, transmitter, and I need comms to be able to communicate with them, establish radio communication with them. All right. So how would you um, get clearance into a Bravo airspace? Uh, I would ask approach um, first and say, okay. hey, I'm coming in. Um, and approach responds with, all right, Cessna 152, um, squawk 5454. Yeah, so we'd squawk 5454 and um, tell are them you what cl- we want to do. Are you uh, if, they the- say, if they say my full tail number, I'd be, I'm cleared to go in. So Bravo, that's Delta. Bravo, you oh. need to hear the phrase cleared into the Bravo. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, that's that's kind of one of the big differences, right? So Bravo, you need to receive a clearance. Delta, you just need two-way communication. Okay. All right. So if I was trying to go to Delta airspace and I said, you know, hey, Phoenix, this is Cessna, you know, 556. Um, can I come in and do some steep turns just on the edge of your pre- edge of your, your airspace? Like Cessna 556, Roger. I didn't okay. get a clearance or anything. It's Cessna 556, Roger. That's That's the end of the conversation. That's two-way communication. They didn't tell me not to do anything. They didn't tell me to do anything. They just acknowledged my existence with my tail number. Bravo, on the other hand, if I say, hey, you know, Phoenix approach, uh, Skyhawk, you know, 595, uh, over here at Chandler trying to transition your airspace, they say, Roger, Squawk 5454. I'm like, all right, Squawk 5454. Cessna, you know, whatever, radar contact, remain clear of the Bravo. Okay. Or if they just responded with radar contact, I still don't have a clearance. You don't have the clearance. Okay. 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 I need to hear the phrase cleared into the Bravo, cleared through the Bravo, cleared through the Bravo right. via such and such transition. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Charlie's is just cleared in or is just your tail. It's just communications. Um, I believe so. I'm going to have to look that one up. It's not on my POA. Um, <clears throat> okay. What you call it? So, you're at a Delta airspace, right? You're at a Delta airport. Mm-hmm. Weather's crap. 2,000 foot ceilings, two mile visibility. Is there anything you could do to leave that airport? I mean, I could get special VFR, but I'm not going to because those are low and I don't want to get stuck in, um, yeah, stuck I mean, in bad weather. <laughs> like Exactly, right? But you know that special VFR is an option. Now, let's say at night, right? It's, no, could I you? Need I- I need IFR to do that at night. Awesome. Awesome. So let's look at your cross country plan. I'm going to get that pulled up. I'm just going to share the screen so that we can all kind of be on the same page. Um, Where'd it go? Oh, I actually downloaded these things. Is it? No, that's a Cherokee. This is one. That's helpful. Um, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. 
All right, so we got your flight plan right up here. Um, <clears throat> just one of my questions. I'm seeing a planned true airspeed um, on the second portions of your climb. So we've got an initial climb uh, at mm -hmm. 70 of a true airspeed, right, which is an appropriate climb speed that's based no. on your time, fuel, and distance to climb chart, right? Right. So, and I know in your POH, there's also the recommendation of five to 10 knots above best climb for best cooling and, and you know, visibility. Um, my concern is the fuel burn. how did you okay. calculate the fuel burn and how did you calculate that it was going to take you about 60 miles to climb that? Um, so we have a, the Delta has some protected airspace for approaches. That's right north of us. So we have to stay low for those 30 miles or so. If that, um, if you look at red, are you pulling up for a flight? I'm pulling up Sky Vector, so it's okay. Maybe. So look at so look at Redmond. It's not on the charts, actually. It's a local local rules okay. kind of thing. Um, there's a ILS approach that comes in to Redmond KRDM that is that starts at um, it's about ten miles out of that echo of Prineville. Here you go. Okay, yeah, no, I've got I've got it pulled up. And I've got Sky. I, I so see what you're saying. That's, that's why that climb is so shallow of going that way. Um, and I just used a uh, really conservative eight gallons an hour there um, when I was calculating all my fuel to account for old engines and some, some kind of shallower climbs that will decrease performance. Um, so that's, that's what all that was in that first part of that is trying to make sure I stay under all that approach corridor. Um, yeah. So I didn't get run over by a Airbus kind of thing. Okay. That, that, um, that, that, that was just my, my, my one. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I meant to put a little note for you on that, but it's a weird look. It's going to be a weird climb because of, I got to stay under that approach corridor. Okay. And I mean, a DPE probably wouldn't even scoff at that because again, a DPE is going to be familiar with the area, right? Yeah. Very rarely are you going to have a DPE that comes from outside your area. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure that well, there wasn't like anything, any kind of weird Oh, okay. Something sure. or another going well, on, making sure you understood what was going it, on. It was there. on purpose. It was on purpose, and I knew what was going on. Okay. Okay. And at, and at ninety, was I figured I'd have a little bit less performance trying to climb a little bit, but um, it depends on the day. Out here, actually, we're on the western side, so it's really dry. And if it's a really dry, really cold day, we get great performance, and I could probably climb at a hundred. But this is just being conservative. Yeah. And that, I've the only thing I might say is, you know, if you're at a climb power setting, like let's say you're at 90 knots at full power, you're definitely going to be burning more than eight gallons an hour. When I'm climbing in my airplane, like I estimate in my airplane about 10 gallons an hour. When I'm climbing, I'm burning 16 to 17. Oh, okay. All right. Um, um, we, not, uh, our people have mentioned just uh, add three gallons for a climb. Okay. Um, I'm assuming you don't have a fuel flow gauge in this. No, no. All right. Um, that was just my one concern. Let's go in and we're, we'll, we'll talk about some airspace, uh, okay. real quick. Let me pull sky vector sure. back up. I'm just going to share my screen. You can oh. see what, yeah, you can see what we're, what I'm looking at. Sorry. You should see a little button that says like view stream watch or something stream. like that. Yeah. Watch stream. Okay. Oh, that's tiny. Hang on. Okay. Oh, sorry. Can I zoom in? No, you're good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we've got this dashed area right here. What is this dashed area it's, representing? Our echo, echo to the ground. Echo to the ground, right? Um, if I'm yep. between here, right? Outside of here, yep. but inside of here, where does echo go down to? Seven. All right. Outside here? Uh, 1,200. 1,200 it is. Um why in this block, right? So we've got, we've got all these grid blocks on a, on a sectional, right? What is this six, nine associated with? That's our highest section point in that grid or in that sector block or that, whatever that, the yeah, other around so, that area, your highest elevation is six, nine plus that's minus that's, that gives you a 500 foot buffer above it as well. Uh, gives you about 300. Okay. Cause here's your highest uh -huh. elevation. Yeah. Right. It's six, five Oh nine. Yeah. Um, and that's 69. Okay. Yeah. Why, okay. why are, why is this dotted in blue? 
Yeah, that's a dried up lake bed. So it might be it might be wet. It might not be wet. Yeah, <laughs> it might be some, water. It might not be. Sometimes water is the way I look yeah. at it. Right. Um. So you've got a bunch of these little things with the the blue dots around the edge with the blue border. What yeah, are those? those? Wilderness areas. We they want you to say stay two hundred two thousand feet above them. Okay. Now is that a regulation? It, it's not. It's rec. It's suggested. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a strong ask, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very strong ask. But you know, if some eagles all of a sudden stop mating because you end up crossing that area too low, yeah, you too many times, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna be pretty upset with you, right? So, what's this? This IR three four two. Is that is it gray? Yeah, it's yeah. gray. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a military route. Okay, can um, I use a it? Low, it's, a, it's a high military. Um, you can. I'm not going to because okay. I might get eaten by a team at some point along the way there. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I would. I would say I would stay away from. Them. Yeah, it's definitely recommended to stay away from them, especially the visual yeah. routes, right? So here's a visual route. Yeah. Um, you know, you could have aircraft in excess of 250 miles or 250 knots along those routes, right? Yep. Um, yeah. Now, what's this? Uh, this that the are you looking at the MOA? Yeah, I'm looking at there. Red Hawk MOA. Um, yep. Um, uh, it's a it's a area that could go active, could not go active, but we can fly in them and they'll go active. And you uh, can still fly in them when they're active, but you don't probably want to. And they'll in the chart sub or in the it'll have um all the altitudes and stuff in the chart on the chart like on the back side of the legend of the chart. Um, and in fourth flight, when they go active, they um, they start they change color. Actually, they uh, okay. they get highlighted. Oh. Hey, we're active. Huh. Look out, we're active. <laughs> I, I, Garmin Pilot doesn't do that. Do I need to switch? I don't know. Maybe uh, I, 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 you're asking the wrong person. I, don't I know. know. I'm just messing. All right. Um, now, how would I use this VOR? Well, you tune it and identify it uh, all right. on one. One one five six. There, it'd be the Kimberly VOR. Um, the, when you identify, you're going to hear those the that Morse code that's da that dot dot dash dash. Yeah, that. Um, and uh, you'll tune to your radials, whichever where wherever you are. <laughs> you're going to find out where you are. If you want to go intercept a radial, you'll go find that radial and intercept it. Um, that one's a directional one, so it should give you if you have the equipment, it'll give you a directional. Direct, how far you are away or distance measuring equipment on it. So, all right. So if I'm right here, right, if I'm crossing, yep. if I'm just right here. Yep. Okay. I'll put a You're little point there. Um, crossing one, three, two. There. Yeah. So if I wanted to fly to this VOR, what would I put in my, like, what would I put on my HSI? If you're down there and you want to go to the VF, VF to the VOR there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going to put, uh, whatever the opposite of one, three, two is. Awesome. In I don't there. need you to do math right now, right. but you okay. understand that you got to put the opposite. I don't care if you, we can all do basic math. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I know you know how to use these lines. Um, can I stop you and ask you a quick yeah, question ahead. on the, regarding the flight plan there? Um, I just, does it matter if you're to or from, if you're just intercepting a, a radial to like, cause on that flight plan, you're just checking and make sure you're in the right spot. Yeah, if you're just VOR, right? yeah, if you're it's, just because it, it will be the same it. one way or the other, right? You just yeah, okay. I just well, want to make sure now for flying to it. Or you want to make sure because you're on the from side most of the time on those, right? Yeah, because I mean, you're most most of the time you're going to be flying away from it, and you've got an HSI, so you should be able to line it up. You shouldn't get reverse sensing. Yeah. If you tune it in okay. backwards, it'll make it seem like it's behind you. All right. Yeah. Um, if you're using like a, a basic, if you're using a swinging needle as opposed to an HSI. Okay. So it does right. matter if you're using a swinging needle, uh, it doesn't matter okay. if you're, you're, you're doing it, but again, it depends okay. on which way you're facing it. Right. So yeah. this one, since I'm going to be kind of crossing it and going a little yeah. bit to it, I think I'm going to put the two in there and then okay. I will catch it eventually. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. let's continue on. I want to make, let me see if I can find anything else along your area that might be a little 
confusing. What airspace is this? The circle is delta to the ground. All right. Up to 4,000. Awesome. Um, can I go in here? Not without permission. And you're probably not going to get it. No, no. <laughs> you're not going to get it. <laughs> um... What's this anchor? That's a seaplane port. Awesome. Most of them are fake. They just get them put there so that they can't tell people they can't land in that body of water. Oh. <laughs> I've tried to fly to so many seaplane bases and they just don't exist. Oh, really? There's absolutely oh. nothing there. It's a beach. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of disappointing because I'm like, oh, I'll go there. That's going to be fun. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> All right. Is there anything on the sectional that you're a little bit confused about, concerned about that you might not understand? Um, because I'm kind of digging around and looking around trying yeah. to find something that's complicated. But I mean, read your sectional uh, key. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, pretty good on the sectional stuff. I think. All right. Um. The yeah no yeah I think that's pretty good. All right. Um. Let's pull up some weather then. Uh, where would I go to get official weather sources? Right? What could I? What What would I use for an official aviation weather source? Um, so, Forflight is actually an official weather source now. It is. Um, oh. Uh, oh no! So, your kid. You know, somebody smashed your iPad. I'm, my iPad. <laughs> I'm going to the phone now. So we can go to. Uh, uh, when it, you can call and get another brief if anybody's done that in the last 50 years or 10 years, I don't know, um, from 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF. Um, and you can get a standard one or a forecast one if you want. Okay. Um, you can go to weather, aviationweather.gov and get um, your stuff there. It's, um, yeah, those are two official places. Awesome, awesome. Now, what, what would you call the most accurate uh, weather report? the closest one to when you're looking at it. Okay. So, so yeah. Also, so a yeah. METAR, yeah, that's pretty accurate, right? Yeah. Um, let's say the METAR's, I don't know, 48 minutes old, but I want to go fly like right now. And I don't feel like waiting on another METAR. What would be a more accurate report? Uh, uh, well, you could get a, either ATOS or ASOS and see what's going on there. I could ask um, the guy that just landed. Ask the guy that just <laughs> landed. <laughs> a pyrep, yeah. right? Yeah, pyrep. Um, yep. See what's going on there. But uh, I heard somebody tell me that pyreps are only good for right when they're issued. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah. They're, they are kind of only good for right when they're issued. Obviously, I'm not going to reference a pyrep that's six years old or six hours old. Definitely not right. one that's six years old. Um, but <clears throat> the amount of times an ace, you know, you get a weather briefing, they're like wind calm, you know, VFR flight recommended, no turbulence. And then you ask the guy that just landed, it's like, nah, it's a shit show out there. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It can, it can start whipping pretty good around here. <clears throat> yeah, so we, um, yeah, you can ask. I mean, if you're in your plane, you can say, hey, how's the weather, everybody? Yeah, right. Um, yeah. I just want to make sure that we bring up, like, that pyreps exist, because so many people just forget sure. that pyreps exist, oh, yeah, no, right? Really? Um, huh. Yeah, because, like, they're, it, they're, a layer on the, they're a layer on my foreflight every time I fly. Well, I think the problem is, is you get so many. If you look right now, I've got the Pyreps for Phoenix pulled up. Okay. All right. Uh, it's because they're all up at flight level 210 and 140 and yeah, whatnot. Us, right. are, us and little yeah. Cessna is like, we don't, you know, it we doesn't don't care. help us. Yeah, yeah it doesn't yeah. help us, right? Right. Um, but, you know, if we start looking at things like um, KSLC in the Rocky Mountains, wait, what's Salt Lake uh, City? SLC, right? KSLC, yeah. Was oh, there just no pyreps near Salt Lake uh, City? I find that okay. hard. There's one. All right. Yeah. So not, nothing yeah, urgent. Flight level no. 3600. So 4737. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's flight level 360. It's light to moderate chop. Uh, yeah. It's right over the Rocky Mountains. Right? So if right. they're getting turbulence way up there at 360, what could I think is going on around the Rocky Mountains right now? There's probably some wind going on yeah. and some up, up, updrafts, perhaps. The the mountains are causing some bumps. Yeah. So, I mean, I could think that there might be mountain waves, even though yeah. 
this is up at flight level 360. If I live in the Rocky Mountain area and I want to go fly, maybe I'm not going to go fly when I start seeing like light to moderate chop or even severe turbulence or, you know, moderate sure. turbulence up at that altitude because I run the risk of those mountain waves pulling a, you know, a Don, John Denver on me and me not being sure. able to outclimb them. Right. Right. Um, so it's not just necessarily about exactly where they happen or exactly how they happen and what aircraft they happen to. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go and look at some weather. Oh. Oh, whatever. Sure. All right. Okay. Right. Can you can you read this uh, METAR to me? Yeah, that's for about a, it. yeah, K O R D. Um, where is, is that Orlando? I think that's Orlando. No, right? it's Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, because that makes and sense. It, yeah, all right. Uh, so it was um, on the 19th of the month at 1951 Zulu time. Uh, two, winds are out of 270 at um, 17 knots, gusting to 25 knots. Visibility is 10 miles. There's a few clouds at, up to. 2100 broken at 25,000. Sorry, 25,000. Uh, temperatures 12, dew points negative three. Uh, altimeter is 292960. It's a AO2 system. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. So what's that other one? Right. That went the the last one. I know I normally I don't really talk about the remarks because a lot of times it's like not like you got to look it up. Um, but yeah. this one's kind of important. What is yeah, that? Yeah, it's got a, a peak peak wind is coming in to uh, two five zero at twenty eight uh -huh. uh, at nineteen oh nine Zulu. Right? Is that right? Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Yep. That's it. Okay. okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's go here. Now we can see why we've got all kinds of shitty weather oh, yeah. in Chicago, don't we? Right? Yeah, yeah. There we we go. got this huge low pressure, this included front. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't look great. Like I don't want to go fly today. It's it's yeah, it's whipping out there right now. Um, do you understand why you would use why you would look at a chart like this? I know a lot of pi a lot of private pilots like they look at this and they go, I don't know what the fuck to do with that. That's way right. too big. That's way too much information. And they sure. just go read a METAR and a TAF. Right. Um, I mean, if you're going along, what you can also help you see what might be coming in, um, what, what might be moving in your direction. Um, maybe you're planning for like two or three days from now. You can say, oh, that high pressure system, let's say we're, well, we're in Oregon. Let's do that. Like we got a low pressure system that might be moving our direction at some point here. And yeah. so, yeah. Um, if you're doing a longer flight, obviously you want to know where all those things are. If you want to go above the high pressures and um, or go on the counter, what is it, the clockwise oh. part of the hybrid, you know, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, so. to try and kept, try and capture the tailwinds and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, it kind of gives you a, a hint to what might be happening long term as well or, you know, in the future. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go to some winds and temps. Um, I Sure, Rocky Mountains, why not? Why not? <laughs> Woohoo! Um, do I know this any of those airports? One. I'm just gonna zoom, I'm just gonna highlight one and zoom in. Um, I think we're up at like thirty six thousand feet for this one, or maybe twenty four thousand feet. So, what's the winds and temps here? Yep. So we are at negative fifty eight for the temperature, three one zero at sixty three knots. Awesome. And what else? What's this one? Yeah, the nine uh, negative. It's a. It's gonna be lower altitude. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So that's it's that's a, it is negative six and uh, I forgot what the ninety nine means. Um, it's very. Is that the variable one? I believe it is variable. Yeah. Yeah, that's variable, and they don't. Uh, that's yeah. probably a, that. It's actually probably a no reading. It helps with a no reading indication there if they have all those other ones around it. Just look it up. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> winds and temps, aviation. <clears throat> uh, 
I love this website, by the way. Yeah. CFI notebook.net. I don't know if you've used it. It's great. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, 99. Yeah. Right here. Winds and light and variable temperature 12. Okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. So Dude. I know you know how to read weather <laughs> sources. If anybody ever tries to give you one of these weather sources and then tries to take the key away. Oh don't, yeah. Don't. Yeah. The, 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 like you're never going to get these without a key. Okay. Well, has anybody ever memorized everything that goes into a meat heart? <laughs> like, there's no thousands of things that they could put in there. It, it, exactly. So, um, I know when I went in for my uh, mock check ride, or for my not my mock check ride, but when I went in for my uh, check ride, I was like, "Shit, I don't remember. Is it the scalloped red one or the 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 the, the <laughs> dotted yellow one? Like, what? Fuck. I yeah, don't know. yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. So, what are the three things that are needed for a thunderstorm? Uh, you got to have up, up, uh, things go air going up, air and water vapor moving up, up, updraft, upward movement. You need a, um, you need to have moisture in the air. Yeah. Um, and it needs to be a, um, uh, the temperature gradient needs to be like, there needs to be a drop as it goes up into the air. The, the, the datum plane needs to be non-standard. What is that? Sorry. The phrase is. Unstable Mist air. Unstable air, yeah. That's got to be. That's it, right? Yeah. Lifting force, moisture, Lifting unstable moisture. air. Right? Do um, doing calculus when I need to do addition. What was that? I'm doing, I'm doing calculus when I need to do addition. Exactly, right? Answer the question as simply as possible, right? Don't be stupid yeah. about it, but, you know, answer right. the question. <clears throat> right? So let's say there's a thunderstorm. It's about 50 miles out. You know, it's about a half hour away from you in the way of cruising, right? Mm -hmm. Um. To the right, it looks pretty clear, but there's a shelf coming off the top of that cloud, off the top of that storm. All right, you already answered the question. <laughs> right. uh, the PX says 60 miles. You want to stay like 60 miles away from sunny thunderstorms? Yep. So yeah. let's talk about your weather minimums. I know you, you've kind of taught about, you've kind of brought up some, you know, some weather minimums. What, yeah. what do you have like that's hard and written down? You are not going to exceed this. Yeah, so I'm not going to exceed a 15 knot crosswind uh, or total to 15 knot total wind. Maybe if it depends on where it's coming. Ten ten cross is really what I'm going to stop at. Crosswind. Okay. Uh, three miles. Uh, no, no, sorry. Um, three thousand foot ceilings. Uh, and all right. What about visibility? Yeah, so I want to at least find visibility. All right. Um, is there anything else? Like, would you go? Are you comfortable flying around in the rain? Um, no, I don't no. want to fly. In. Right. Um, there's, there's another minimum. Uh, uh, yeah, here. Uh, yeah, especially here because um, our our we our laps rate can get really we can get to freezing rain real quick. Yep. Here. Um. So. I know with my students, what I do is I have them write down all their minimums. And I mean, I'm talking about like dumb stuff, right? Um, okay. Like how many hours have you flown in the last week? Okay. Right. Do you Fair. really think that you need to go do another two, right? If you've done 10 this week alone, you really need another two hours, right? Or whatnot. Um, how long are you willing to go flying for? I know a student pilot or a private pilot probably shouldn't do some of the ferry flights that I've done, you know, flying straight for nine hours in one day. Right. Is it legal? Yeah, sure. It's legal. Okay. But, um, and I, I make them write it down and take a picture of it and it's their phone background, right? For flight has minimum, has like a minimums function, I think a weather minimums, personal minimums function. And it will alert you if you're like trying to do flight planning and oh, okay. the weather exceeds your personal minimums. I know Garmin Pilot has it. I think Four Flight has the same kind of function. And I forgot right. that I had like my student pilot weather minimums in yeah. Garmin Pilot. And it was like, oh, you can't do this. And I'm like, the fuck I can't. That's right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's talk about icing, right? What does icing do to an aircraft? Uh, it takes away all its aerodynamics. It makes the airplane go boom. <laughs> well, it's not necessarily boom, but like. That, it makes it harder to fly. Yeah, it definitely makes them harder to fly. So what yeah. would you do if you started picking up icing? Uh, descend, if, I, if it's safe, um, and turn on my anti-heat, my anti-icing things, like um, my defroster on my windshield, and my <laughs> carb heat, and 
there's not much I can do for uh, my pedo heat and not and make sure um, I, there's not much I can do for the wings except descend and get down and try to warm them up. Um, All right. So, would you consider putting flaps down? Um, yes, yeah, I would. The answer is no. No, the I answer is no. Um, is you that- don't. You don't know what's going on back there. You don't want to end up with ice on the front of your flaps and being unable to get them up. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Cause you remember your yep. flaps kind of drop and separate from the wing. Yep. If you, yep. st- and you get air going up over through the, in that gap to ec- to energize the wing. Right. Well, what ends up happening yep. is there's that restriction right there between okay. your wing and your flap. That's a Venturi. Yep. What happens inside a Venturi? Things get cold. Pressure drops. Things get cold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where do you think the ice is going to build up? Right there. It's okay. Build up right there on the leading edge of your flap. Right. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> we also want to land pretty flat. I've built, I've picked up ice in a Cessna before you land pretty flat. You come in at like 80 knots. <laughs> okay. And just, and just float your way down. Yep. And you just float your way down. Um, don't touch your brakes until you know, you've made a couple rotations and broken any ice off of your wheels. Um, okay. cause ice will build up on your wheels. Everyone always yeah. thinks about the lifting surfaces. No one ever thinks about the dragging surfaces. Yeah, yeah. No, and the wheels are where we first look for icing. Yeah, because um, you got those little like those little like nubbins that come off of the tire. Yeah, those are going to be the first things that build up ice, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's get into some aerodynamics. What do flaps allow us to do? What do they, What do they give to the aircraft? Uh, they give they allow us to fly at slower speeds and high and um yeah, slower speeds, yeah. higher angle of attacks, so we can slow down. All right. Um, really good answer. DP is going to love, allow us to dis- increase our descent rate without increasing our speed. Right. Okay. All right. Increase our descent rate. With, yeah. Okay. Cause that's mainly what we use flaps for in this aircraft, isn't it? Like very rarely are we putting flaps down for anything other than to increase our descent rate without increasing our airspeed. Cause that's how we land this thing. Yep. I increase the, All right. And, so, and slow flight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, slow flight is purely a demonstrative purpose. Like we're not doing slow flight to like we're, we're, we do slow flight in the training environment to show how to control the aircraft and that the aircraft will behave differently at slow, slower speeds. Okay. Right. The only time I've ever like really done slow flight is flying into Oshkosh when a, a like some ultralight cut me off and they could only do like 60 knots. So I'm <laughs> sure we, right. we, use- Slow flight a lot for spacing in okay. our busy. We're a non-towered airport that should be towered. <laughs> but like it's it gets nuts. Um, it's actually really good for our situational awareness, but it gets nuts. So we we end up slow flighting in the downwind quite a bit just to keep oh, separate. Wow. All right. Well, that's terrifying. Well, let's talk about stalls. What happened? <laughs> what is a stall? <laughs> uh, a stall is when. Uh, that air gets disrupted because you've exceeded the critical angle of attack. All right. <clears throat> What's going to happen to your stall speed as you increase bank? Stall speed as I increase bank. Um, is it going to go up or down or stay the same? Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> this is the, the trick question. Not the trick question, but it's on the one on sporties that I always tried to overthink. And it stays the same. No, it definitely goes up because we're increasing our load factor, right? Yeah, we are. So what it, load Bank factor is the increase stall speed. Sorry. Yes. Well, brain just uh, totally blank. And but, here's the, here's the thing that I want you to recognize. We've been at this for about an hour and 20 minutes now. How's your brain feel? Pretty exhausted. Right. Acknowledge right. that in the check ride and go, Hey, I need a break. Okay. Right. Okay. Acknowledge that you're tired. Don't let the DPE be like, no, you can't drink water. You can't take a piss. Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> go, okay. you know, um, <clears throat> bring snacks, right? Share with the DPE. I, I, I brought cookies to check rides. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, is this a, a, it was like, is this I, bribery? <laughs> Maybe. No, I'm kidding. No, it's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. but, Bank, bank and weight increase stall speed. Yes, bank and weight increase stall speed. But the thing is, is bank and weight are doing the same thing. Okay, right. um, they're increasing the load factor. They're increasing how much the airplane effectively weighs. Because that's really what banking does: is it increases the effective weight of the airplane because the airplane believes it's heavier. Okay. Right. 
So that's right. why it increases our stall speed. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what happens if uh, I stall or better question, do you understand what uncoordinated means? I know everyone looks at the ball and they're like, oh, look, I'm coordinated. Well, what does that mean? Um, it means your plane's in line with the travel of, fl of flight. Yep. The tail is behind yep. the nose. That's, that's really the easiest way to think about it. All right. So what's going to happen if I stall in an uncoordinated fashion or what am I risking? What are you, you're risking a stall or a, I mean, it could, the plane could stop flying. <laughs> I mean, well, could, okay. So how do yeah. we enter a spin? Um, how do you enter a spin is a, uh, both things get stalled and you spin, right? But, uh, well, the, it's, it's an uncoordinated. Yeah, one, one, wing, one wing is more stalled than the other wing. All right. So yes. I've got I've got my fun little Piper 140 that I've had uh I don't know for God. It doesn't even have wheels. It barely has wheels anymore. But either way, right. if I'm flying along, right, and I stall, yep. the wing should yep. generally just kind of drop all on its own, right? It should just right. whoop nice and evenly. But if right. I stall like this, yeah. which wing's gonna stall first? The the bottom one. Well, it's actually gonna be the upper one because the upper one has a higher angle of attack. Right. Let's look at our angle of attack versus relative yeah, okay. wing. So here's okay. the air, yep. right? Yep. So it's going to be the upper one. Okay. I'm uncoordinated. I stalled. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's where, that's how we enter a spin. Do you know where that's most likely going to happen? Uh, base to final. It's going to be base to final with a, with a crosswind. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do you understand why? With the crosswinds? Well, do you understand like why in the base to final turn? Well, yeah, because that's your slowest. You're going slow. Your slowest. You don't have enough airspeed to, and you're at your highest angle of attack at that point. So you're at, at your closest to reaching that critical. So the wings are going to stall. Well, um, a stall doesn't necessarily indicate a spin, right? Stalling, right? Can, you know, we can stall all day. Okay, because because you already have one lower, one wing's lower than the other, right? And so you're already kind of set up into a spin. No, you, you've got one wing lower than the other. What ends up happening, right? So the camera, it's the runway, right? Okay. Um, so this airplane's on its base turn, and it's about to start turning for final, all right? Okay. But I've got a little bit of a crosswind, so I'm getting blown out here. So I listened to my instructor, and my instructor told me never exceed 30 degrees of bank in the pattern. That's dangerous. So I'm going to stomp on the rudder to try and point me oh. back to the runway. Okay. Oh, now, you've got, <laughs> yeah, now you're skidding your way around there. Exactly. What happens when I start skidding? My drag increases, right? So yep. my descent rate's going to increase. What am I going to do to stop my descent rate? Well, I should apply power, but right. what am I probably going to do? I'm going to pull. Gonna pull back. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. That's why you get that base to final turn. Okay. okay. I've only heard of one instructor, uh, one, one time of a student putting an instructor in that situation, actually entering the first stage of the spin and recovering. So it's dangerous. Yeah, There's <laughs> okay. not, a lot of, not a lot of time, and you're no. um, you're pretty close. And you, yeah. So, do you know what the four stages of a spin are? Yeah, you have the um, going up, <laughs> the incipient, but like where it's starting to stall. Um, one, the actual spin part, and then the recovery. All right. So <clears throat> we've got our entry. That's the uncoordinated entry. stall. Right? Yep. That's that uncoordinated stall. Then we have the incipient. It's the first few rotations. It's going to be about one to three rotations. Okay. okay. And then we have the fully developed and then hopefully recovery. Fully developed. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so your aircraft, when you go to practice steep turns, right? You notice once you exceed 30 degrees of bank, sometimes you got to give it a little bit of aileron out of the turn to make sure it doesn't continue banking over. Do you know what that's called? No. Overbanking tendency. Do you understand why that oh. happens? <laughs> <laughs> why? Like, I mean, sorry. Um, let me make sure I understand what you're talking about. Um, like that. I want to pull it after 30. I want to pull it back towards 30 again. Oh, well, we're overbanking. So when you're doing steep turns, right, you go all the way to 30. 45 degrees bank. If you yeah. were to just neutralize the yoke, where's uh -huh. the plane going to go? Is it going to continue going into the turn or is it going to try to bring itself out? It's going to try to bring itself out because of if you're the, less than 30. Yes. Okay. Once we get over, over that 30 mark, we end up with those over banking tendencies. Okay. Right. <clears throat> um, and 
it's kind of hard to think about it because in the airplane, you're just kind of flying the airplane. You're not really feeling the fact that you're giving outside aileron to try and keep it from rolling into the turn deeper. So I want you to practice it. Next time you get into the airplane, put it into a steep turn, maintain coordination, but then bring the ailerons back to neutral. All right. Or even just let go, figure out where the airplane's going to continue going. It's probably going to continue going into the bank. Do you understand why? Huh? Um, no, but I'm trying to think of it. Every time we've done them, we can't, like, we have a hard time. I mean, maybe it's because we're chicken and we don't want to keep it in that 45, but (laughs) I've never had any problems with it. Just keep going. So a Cessna is pretty stable. I will say a Cessna is pretty stable. It's got a pretty keel effect. It happens more to these pipers. Um, But let's just look at the aerodynamics of the situation, right? So as I'm banking, as I'm turning, right, which wing is moving faster? The wing that's inside of the turn or the wing that's on the outside of the turn? The wing on the outside of the turn. So which wing's going to be generating more lift? The outside. Which is going to make the airplane want to continue to bank. Oh, keep going over. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, so try it again next time you go fly in a Cessna, given that it's a, it's a high wing, you know, you've got the body of the airplane kind of pulling it back to center as opposed to with this Piper, right? Um, low wing and mid wing airplanes are a little bit more susceptible to overbanking, right? All right. Um, I'll, uh, I'll see like tomorrow. I'll go try it tomorrow. Yeah. Well, let's talk about adverse y'all. What's adverse y'all? Uh, adverse y'all is the like left turning tendencies of a, of my little Cessna. No. So, so there is left turning tendencies. We'll talk about, well, I guess the FAA changed the wording. It's turning tendencies now, not left turning. So I have to oh, correct really? myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. there's turning tendencies, but then there's adverse yaw, right? So when I use my ailerons, where does the nose want to go? If I don't use my rudders, where does the nose want to go? Uh, opposite. of your Yeah. Turn. It tries to swing opposite of the turn, right? That's yeah. adverse yaw. Okay. All right. Do you understand why it's happening? Yeah, because your plane is wanting to stay central to the turn, right? It's not that it's wanting to stay central to the turn. So when I bank over, which aileron goes down? The the one you're turning towards. No, sorry. The, the one you're wing turning. goes oh. down. Yeah, yeah, the wing goes down. The, the aileron yeah. on yeah. the outside of the turn goes down. Yeah which is going to increase its lift. That's why I can bank. But when I increase lift, I also increase drag. Right. Okay. That's why we get that adverse yaw is because when I drop that aileron down, I get uh, more induced drag being generated by that wing because it's generating more lift, dragging the wing behind. All right, and technically, once you get like established in the turn, Um, I think Cessnas really do take advantage of this. Once you get established in the turn, the fact that that wing is moving faster than the inside wing, um, it generates more parasitic drag, even if your ailerons are neutral, trying to bring the airplane out of its turn with yaw. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, that's that's, that's some complex, you know, aerodynamics, not necessarily required for private pilot, right? Okay. Um, So we we touched on turning tendencies. Do you know what they are? Do you know? I mean, we got four of them, I believe. Yeah, we got torque which is just the engine spinning. Uh, we got um, a uh, gyroscopic. You, have a, you got a big, basically a big gyroscope on the front of that plane with the propeller, which causes the turning. Uh, you got some slipstream air, uh, aerodynamic slipstreaming from that propeller that hits the rudder in the back, or the, sorry, the vertical stabilizer in the back, um, causes that tail to <laughs> shift back around. Um, and then you have, uh, hang on, let me, he goes, um, oh my gosh, pork, gyroscopic procession, asymmetrical slipstream, did I get, Am I missing one? I'm missing one. So you got asymmetrical thrust. Some people call it asymmetrical propeller loading. A lot of people just call it P factor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the lift, the lifting of the propeller. Yep, I would have gotten yep. it. Yeah. <laughs> the the downward motion of the propeller is gives a little bit more than the up, yeah. Than the up so portion. yeah, you know, and it, it 
I'd definitely try to clean up the wording when you go to respond with that yep. question, right? Yep. Um, so P factor, right? It's the fact that the descending blade is generating more thrust than the ascending blade when you are at a high angle of attack. Okay, yep. when the nose is yep. pointed up, you have a um, <clears throat> the descending blade on the right side is generating more thrust than the ascending blade on the left side because it has a greater angle of attack to the relative wind. Okay. Then we've got torque. That one's pretty straight fat, or straightforward. For every yep. action, there's an equal yet opposite reaction. Propeller twists to the right, airplane twists yep. to the left. It's just like when, you know, Vin Diesel said in the first Need for Speed, you know, had so much torque, it twisted the frame off the line. Right. <laughs> right. right. Um, then we got spiraling slipstream. You did a pretty good job on that one, right? It's a little tornado being generated around the airplane, hitting the vertical stabilizer. Um, and then there's gyroscopic precession. Um a lot of people struggle a little bit with gyroscopic precession. I struggled with this one up until somebody in the comments actually corrected me. Um, gyroscopic precession. Can you um, can you talk me yeah. through how that one really applies to an airplane? Yeah. So the, your your um, propeller is spinning up front, and the um, force of a gyroscope is always ninety degrees from the spin. That's why your bike stays up when. Um, when you're riding a bike instead of falling yeah. over. And so that 90 degrees is always going to be one way with that gyroscope at the front. And so that's where that, that turning tendency comes from that 90 degrees to the gyroscope. Okay. So it's 90 degrees in the direction of the rotation, not 90 degrees to the direction, not 90 degrees. Um, but it's just based on like how you were holding yeah. your hands, I want to make sure it's 90 yeah. degrees in the direction of rotation, not 90 degrees relative to the rotation. You okay. know what I mean? So like yeah. if I have a gyro that's spinning like this, you know, I've got this little airplane working as my gyro. I apply a torque to the top of it. It's going to be mm -hmm. felt 90 degrees in the direction of rotation, not 90 degrees perpendicular, perpendicular to its rotation. Okay. You get what I'm saying? So again, we'll go back to the bike example, right? If I'm riding my bike, I don't turn a bike by just twisting the handlebars, right? I right. lean. Yeah. Well, that lean is the torque being applied. The, the fact that it's the fact that I turned is because that torque is being felt 90 degrees in the direction of the rotation of the tire. Okay. Right. Um, all right. We talked about, we talked about that. All right. Uh, you're up at some high elevation up there, right? You got some mountains and whatnot going around. You've got a field elevation of like 4,000 feet. You've got a cruise uh, altitude of, uh, what was it? 10,000? Yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is there anything you might be, want to be concerned about up at 10,000 feet in the way of uh, yeah, staying sure. awake? Sure. Staying awake? Yeah. For sure. Uh, um, hypoxia. Yeah. yeah awesome. So what kind of hypoxia would that be? Right? We've got four different types of hypoxia. Yeah, that'd be uh, hy hypemic hypoxia up there. So no, 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 no. Hypoxic hypoxia. Hypoxic hypoxia. Well, tell me what hypemic hypoxia is. Yeah, that's where um, that's like what uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is. It's where the the it your blood cells can't absorb actually absorb the oxygen coming in yeah. to get blocked. So I wouldn't necessarily say blood cells can't absorb it because that could also be taken as like uh, as histotoxic, right? Because if your blood cells right. are damaged due to poisoning, right? Okay. All right, so it's the building up of something else on your cells, blood cells that don't. It's allow the fact that something else has bound to your red blood yeah. cells, right? Okay. It's the fact that something else is bound to the cells which would normally carry oxygen. Okay. okay. Um. <clears throat> now, what's the what's the aim? The aim actually has some rec or recommendations, or even the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge has some recommendations when it comes to uh, oxygen usage. They're they're lower than the requirements, right? So what are those recommendations for day? What altitude does the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge recommend starting the usage of supplemental oxygen? Um, I don't know what the recommended one is. I know what the required ones are. Um, yeah, the recommended's 10,000. Let's get into the required ones then. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 12.5, you need it. Uh, the crew needs it if you're there for 30 minutes or more. At 14, every uh, the crew has to have it. At 15 has to be offered to everybody in the plane that the crew needs to be wearing it. All right. Now let's say I pop up to 13,000 for 26 minutes and then I pop back down and then I pop back up to 13,000 for you know another 26 minutes. Is that legal? Um, 
You know, I don't know. It's cumulative uh, time it, throughout the cumulative? flight. It's okay. so no, okay. that's not okay, okay. right? Um, I mean, I wouldn't. Yeah, it doesn't sound okay, but I don't know. Not legal. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. it's like it's like it doesn't sound okay that like my logbook can technically be a stack of bar napkins, but technically it's legal. Right. Okay. Right. Um, awesome that you know exactly when everybody needs oxygen. Um, let's ask one last thing when it comes to alcohol, right? Um, what's the limits for uh, alcohol? Yeah, so it's 0.04 um, in your blood, uh, eight hours bottle of throttle, so to speak, or if you're feeling the effects of a hangover, you're like, no, no, don't do Awesome, it. <laughs> awesome. You recognize that hangover is still under the influence, right? Do you know where to go in the event that you there is a medication that you want to take for whatever reason? Not sure. Like, do you know what website you can go to to find the resources to verify if that's okay or not? Yeah, I had a cold the other day or cold last month that knocked me down, and I was like digging through that. Um, there's there's a the AOPA has a good one that um, lists a lot of the medications, and then there's a the FAA put one out, but it's really hard to read and dig mm -hmm. through. Um, but uh, both of those, those are two places that I looked. AMAS is another good one. AMAS. You can straight up put in the generic or the prescription or the the the, the scientific name of a medication, and okay. it will tell you. Now it does have a disclaimer saying, "Hey, this is not a federal website. This is not you know like still talk to an AME, right?" Right. Um, but that's just a a really good resource. Okay. Now a lot of instructors and student pilots get this one wrong. You got a first class medical, I'm assuming, right? Yes. All right. What happens after 12 months? After uh, uh, over 40. Let me go to my chart. There's a nice little chart in here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> after oh. after so six, over after, I'm over 40. So after six months, it goes to second class privileges. And then after a year, it goes to third class. And then after two years, it expires. Awesome. Awesome. So a lot of people don't like, it's good that you acknowledge that, you know, you're over 40 and it reverts to second class. Um, yeah. after six months, a lot of people think that it will revert to second class after 12 months if they're under 40. And that's not the case. Okay. It goes to third, right? it goes to third class goes directly to straight, third. Straight to third yeah. Yep. All right. Um, do you have any questions? Um, probably, but my <laughs> brain can't, can't get them out. <laughs> no. Um, no. No, that, this was super helpful to, yeah, this was good. Yeah. I mean, I'd say you did pretty good. You, uh, you understand how to navigate your POH. Uh, there's a few limitations and a few memory items. I was a little, you were a little yeah. shaky on. Um, yeah. The, uh, the engine tires, I'll, I'll get, I'll get those back. Yeah. Um, but nothing that was like, oh my God, this guy's going to die. Sure. <laughs> okay. Right. And some of these, you know, they, they've, they've been like that where I'm just like, Ooh, yeah, you know, um, not naming any oh. names, but just just keep sure. that in mind, right? Read through your POH, make sure you understand the aircraft, um, and you did pretty good on the way of that. It's just a few memory items um, and limitations. Um, as far as the check ride, like having an like, if I just bring a drawing of the altimeter with me, it's so much easier to get those out, those numbers out um, with the altimeter drawing in there. Is that a bad idea? Or like, I think like, oh, he doesn't really know what's going on. You know, because no. I'm so used to looking in the plane and be like, okay, needles here. I know what this means. Needles, you know, kind of thing. Oh, for your airspeed limitations? For the airspeed stuff. Um, um, maybe not have everything to find out, but just like, <clears throat> just like so see the altimeter. You mean your um, airspeed indicator, right? Yeah, the airspeed. Yeah, sorry. I was like, air, altimeter, like what limitations? I was He's doing lots of good math. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily... My only concern is that um, you're not really going to have it written out in the airplane, right? Um, and I know sure. that there are, you know, you've got those markings on the airspeed indicator um, and you know how to stay within them. Um, yeah. It's really just a good rule of thumb to have them memorized, right? Yeah. To have the I limits would... of the aircraft memorized. Not right. necessarily everything. Like, I'm not expecting you to understand that at 245, it's, you start the caution range of your oil temperature. Sure. To be honest, I'm not even sure if that's correct. So don't quote me on that one. Right, it sounds right, right. correct, but, um, okay. <clears throat> but, um, you know, knowing your V speeds and emergencies are kind of paramount. Right. Um, when I did stage checks for UND, I just had a worksheet 
and I just said, give me your V speeds. And I just handed it to him. And I was like, I want your V speeds and emergencies written down verbatim. Okay. All right. Um, no, that's, no, does that okay. make me a dick? I don't know. Um, no. but students that couldn't answer them usually didn't do very well on the rest of the check ride okay. or the rest of the stage check. Right. Um, actually read the regulations. I know everyone uses the mnemonics 91 to, uh, for 91, 205, um, you know, a tomato flames, flaps, all that jazz. Um, actually read through them because it makes a whole lot more sense. I know it's written. It's hard to digest them sometimes, um, but read them, uh, look them up, right? Every time there's something broken on your airplane, look up, find the regulation that's associated with that item and say, even if you know you you're fine, right? Find the regulation. That's the best way to learn regs is incorporate them into your day to day life. Okay. Right. Um, let me continue on regulations, your privileges and limitations. Awesome. You know, you, you knew exactly what you can and can't do. Uh, even when I tried to dig in the aeronautical decision making is great when it comes to things like special VFR, uh, there wasn't much, um, you know, your cross country plan was pretty solid. Um, I had a few questions about that 90 knots things, but given that you, you know, we worked through those, um, you understand weather, pretty well um aerodynamics was a little weak um go through the p hack understand what causes stall what causes stalls what causes uh spins you know uncoordination versus coordination um uh, you understood navigation pretty well uh it's pretty easy when you got an hsi um, but if you are going to go fly, I definitely recommend like when you go get your instrument rating, fly some six pack stuff in some old, uh, style swinging needles. Um, cause it is, it is an absolute game changer. I have flown my airplane with swinging needles, not an HSI to two CDIs. I have flown that thing down to ILS minimums, you know, 200 feet yeah. from the ground. If all I learned in was glass, there's no way in hell I would have been able to do that without dying. Okay. Like if we're just going to be frank about it, it is. Um, and I got a bunch of buddies that make a whole lot more money than I do that refuse to buy airplanes because they can't afford something with a G1000. <laughs> right. Because that's all they've ever flown. So use the opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, medical stuff, you were pretty good. Awesome on the, maybe refresh yourself on the hypoxia ones. Took us a little while to get to it. That's all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Other cool. than the limitations things, I think you're ready for the check ride. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, uh, my buddy Saul was sitting with us. He, he was yeah. kind of Do you have any out. questions, Saul? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, I have to go over like the V speeds and stuff too, as well. Because uh, right. I'm going back and forth on the. I just have them written on my notepad on my flight on my new board, so I need to memorize those too. Yeah, and I know the difficulty switching between aircraft that use miles per hour and knots and what like. The fact yeah. that we ever had airplanes that were using miles per hour airspeed indicators still blows my mind. Um, yeah. Cause the amount of these that I've done where the students like, Oh, we changed it to a G five. And I'm like, okay, well your POH still says miles per hour. Right. Uh, oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, but my check right plane is not, you know that. So, <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. Definitely get the hours that you need in that, in the check ride plane. Yeah. Um, it's good enough. Yeah, so. it's just been in, it's been in a hundred hour this week, so or the last couple of days. So, oh, y'all y'all aren't helping with that. Get that done in like twelve hours. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I think they're putting the calendar. I'm putting the calendar yeah. back on this morning when we got out of the plane. I think we were slowing down. Yeah, we would definitely <laughs> slow. <laughs> well, um, if you get the opportunity, helping mechanics um, is, oh, yeah, a, is, is a wonderful way to learn. Um, I do all the own, ma- my own maintenance on my airplane and my mechanic signs it off. Okay. Um, but now I know my airplanes put together well. Sure. So, yeah. all right. Yep. Cool. Um, anything else that you're thinking about? No, I think that's, uh, that's about, that's about it. So, okay. um, you got my email, you know, shoot me any yep. emails. If you got any other follow-up questions, you know, take a break, sure. go drink some water and acknowledge when you're getting tired on check rides. Okay. Right? Sure. Got it. All right. Y'all enjoy the rest of your night. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yep. Bye.